itself. Hi, we are here on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh speaking peoples at the Vancouver International Film Festival with Anthony Shin and Yoon of the film that just won the TIFF Platform Award, Price Boy Sleeps. Hello. Hi. You are now a few weeks into uh, a massive feature premiere and festival run. Uh, you're coming off of incredible, immense success at TIFF with Rice Boy Sleeps, and now you're bringing it home, mm -hmm. uh, or to a home. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you feeling about this? Insane. It's been life-changing in so many ways. Um, it's been very overwhelming. Uh, but, you know, I'm so grateful and excited for all the positive attention that the film's been getting. Um, you know, yeah, like, you, you know, you, you make a film going like, hope it's okay, like, hope some people want to see it, but then, you know, it's hard to imagine what it's actually going to be like if you know, people do want to see it. So, Yoon, uh, you are also celebrating the TIFF 2022 Rising Star Award and the Share Her Journey Spotlight with your breakout, breakthrough performance. Thank you. Uh, now, this was, this was your first role. It was, it was really too much, so it was really grateful, it, it is really grateful, and of course I didn't imagine that I have this kind of reality have, like when I sent a uh, to him, so at the moment I was, I was thinking that maybe I can try, just because I never done audition, so let's give a chance. So, and then I, I sent a video to him and then as the audition process goes, I was really afraid. I was thinking, what if I really got this job? I'm not ready, <laughs> yeah, but I'm here and I'm so happy to be here. I am just in awe of your performance and that this was, this was your first, because it's, it's so flawless and it seems like you've been acting forever. Mm -hmm. And the way that you serve the story um, with so much grace and so much power and so internally for much of it um, is really something. So yeah, we spent about a week together um, yeah. going through some exercises, going through a bunch of exercises okay. uh, and then we went into the sort of, we just kind of naturally segued into the rehearsal process. Okay. Our production process was actually the, uh, the uh, Vancouver oh. Symphony, uh, the Vancouver Opera House, the oh. Opera. Okay. Rehearsal hall. Okay. Um, so my office was like this little rehearsal room, um, and so we would we kind of taped it all out so that it matched the locations we were shooting in, and we put you know kind of temp furniture in, and we walked it all through, and then and then we would go on the weekends and evenings and go to the actual locations if we had access. Now this story is very autobiographical. Well, you know, I grew up in you know in the nineties. And uh, I lived on the island, Vancouver Island. Um, and back then, there weren't a lot of Korean people there. Uh, and we also didn't have, we, you know, internet wasn't what it is today. And so, you know, we, and, and Korean culture wasn't nearly as popular and available as it is now. And so um, I was, yeah, I grew up just always, always being different. I looked different from everybody else that was in my classroom. And I dressed differently, I spoke differently, I, I, my, I smelled differently because of the food my mom cooked in all and, and um, just as a result of that, I, you know, I, I stood out and I dealt with certain kinds of challenges as a kid. Um, but I also don't think that my challenges were, I, I don't think I was like, just so uniquely different that I was just picked on by everybody, you know. I really don't want people to think that I grew up just being a victim of bullying and racism my whole life. It wasn't that, it was just, you know, that we just, I dealt with certain cultural and racial challenges and differences um, growing up in those neighborhoods. And so then, as I got older, I wanted to make a film about my experiences um, and the the questions that I was having as an adult about my own, my, my cultural and, and um, racial identity and my relationship with my parents. And uh, 
I got to writing and then um, what started out as me wanting to tell an, an honest, authentic story about my experiences as, a, as a, an immigrant became more so about um, uh, uh, generational trauma and adult grief. And that was what I really tried to focus on and, and that I felt like was my personal connection to it. And then within that, the, the kind of the, the spine of the story happens to touch on you know, an immigrant and touches on racism, touches on cultural differences, illnesses, and, you know, parental, parent-child relationships. And there was something really striking about the scene in the factory when she meets her friend and suddenly everything that So Young's been going through and holding it all together and being so strong and finally finds somebody who's also from Korea, and just that explosion of laughter, of joy, uh, there's so much in that scene of, of meeting community finally, and being able to just be exactly who you are. Had you experienced that here uh, in Canada before? Was that something that you knew? Did that come really um, authentically uh, in the moment? Had you rehearsed that? Have you discussed it? Well, we never make any rehearsal for that. But if you want to ask me my personal experience, um, I have very specific moments that I I had experienced because uh, on the street I like I was hanging out with Anthony and his his sister. Mm -hmm. On the street, there are like four of us, yeah, the, the sisters, the couple, and Anthony and I. But suddenly, I feel myself like I I have so much like self consciousness because I don't know no no one no one watched us, but but I don't know that was really weird experience for me because I came from Seoul. I live in Seoul, so in Seoul, like everyone looks like me. <laughs> so, so whenever I hang out with my friends, so it could be like nine people or eight people, so many people. But I never care about the others on the street. But in here, immediately I conscious I have more awareness about myself. So that was really strange feeling. I never, I, I had. Yeah. Um, did you go back to Korea? Were you able to see that? Yeah. And connect back. I, you know, the, the trip back and meeting relatives and kind of the character rediscovering his roots um, and his identity, that, that part of it was inspired by my own personal experience. It wasn't necessarily just one trip. Yeah. Um, it was a few different trips and uh, my mom is okay. She, she, she didn't, she's not, she hasn't passed away. She's alive and well. She's very happy and healthy. Um, but I did lose my father at an early, a fairly early age. So it was more so about that experience of um, having lost my father and then that absence making me think about, you know, what is my relationship to my family, my relatives, and my heritage. and. Um, and so I found myself being drawn to going back quite a bit, and I was going at least once a year to Korea. Yeah. Um, and there was a curiosity to, to just learn more about him through other people, and sort of like walking through the streets and the areas that I, I, knew, I knew that he had when he was young. And you know, there was like a sense of healing, a um, sense of closure, and felt closer to him, I suppose. Just just to know that like, oh like these are the streets these are the places that he would have hung out, you know. This is where he would you know, this is where he slept when he was younger and stuff like that, you know, this and so yeah, that's largely what inspired that sort of third act of the film. Okay. Well the word closure too is it it really feels um, in many aspects that as they begin to have some closure 
in their relationship, things left unsaid. Um, the mystery of his father uh, that was so young just keeps resisting talking about, resisting talking about, and, and those truths left unspoken. Um, it, it comes across that it is when the closure begins to happen, it opens suddenly a liberation and a liberation for the mother um, to be able to let out you know, what she's been holding on to so much and for, for her son to be able to meet her finally and, and really you know, be there together. So what was that like for you being able to go back and shoot in Korea with him? We, we, had, we went through so much events and happening in Vancouver together. So I was at the moment I was totally like like so young. Mm -hmm. So the shooting in Korea was so beautiful, and, and I think everything we shot in the like in the road. Chronological yeah, order, yeah. almost. Oh yeah. wow! Okay. Almost. Yeah. So I could naturally follow my emotion in our journey okay. together with my son. So. So I deeply feel like grief and also as well as I, I could feel like so much freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the ca camera captured that moment exactly. Really did. Mm -hmm. But you did the work because that liberation mm -hmm. unlocked mm -hmm. and that scream, mm -hmm. spoiler alert, <laughs> uh, but that scream the layers of liberation to have challenging conversations um, and really get her courage. Um, you can see it falling away, but also her liberating. Uh, she, I think she really wanted to try to like, make a reconnection with herself and her past and where she come from. I think that's kind of a like, statement to statement for her, like saying, now I'm ready to replace my past. Yeah. I interpret the story in that way, so, yeah. It really comes across mm -hmm. that, that as she's letting go, she's actually starting. Mm -hmm. um, and starting in her, her freedom, her liberation, being able to be all of who she is mm -hmm. for herself, with her relationship to her son, and to Simon, Let's talk about Simon. Can we talk about Simon? Simon's gone. <laughs> Simon's gone. Simon was heartbroken. He just left. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I have a habit of I, 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 I intentionally don't write any characters that I could play because I don't want to. I don't even want to be tempted. So this character had been written as a completely different character for quite a while. Um, okay. Uh, the character was actually South Asian. Right. And uh, and then it was through the drafts, you know, th there's something about the character that wasn't working, and then it just seemed like I, you know, I, I, I had to play the part. Yeah. Uh, I knew it so well, like I, I, I like looked the part, whatever that means. <laughs> I felt like I just kind of fit, and also just, you know, at that time we had already cast Yoon and Ethan, and it's like, okay, this dyna dynamic feels right. We were spending a lot of time together anyways, and so I thought, you know, this feels natural, and so I'll give it a go, and it was, it was fun, it was hard, yeah. um, I don't think I'd want to do it again. Yeah, and Simon's a really interesting catalyst, um, sort of bringing up, uh, but you know some of the questions he proposes, uh, and you know, keeping the plot moving forward or the urgency a little bit moving forward for so young um, was really interesting because it does force truths to come up. It does force things to be looked at, um, and and it's sort of when the courage and the courageous conversations start happening because of Simon and also. Simon really um, did provide some buoyancy and levity to their situation and some lightness and uh, to be able to see, you know, you go through the, the ability to just finally allow to receive help and to receive 
not just help, but someone just wanting, really wanting to authentically be there, um, both at work and in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was a really lovely dynamic, and um, and it was it was really powerful to see also your community of the women in the factory yeah. working together, and uh, that being the other place where they could just let go and be themselves and laugh and have delight and make fun of things. And, yeah, when Soyang made up her own community. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she really did. Yeah, before I think she doesn't, she didn't have but and later she, she made it. What gave you the, the choice writing to give Soo Young to be able to verbalize enough is enough if you do this again and you teach that to her son? Where did that come from? My own mom. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, my scary aunts, uh, my grandma, both my grandmas, uh, both of you's grandmas as well. Like, you know, these are these are women that I grew up with and were so familiar with, and you know, I've seen so many examples of what you're referring to in real life. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it wasn't even really, like, a conscious decision of, like, I'm going to write the, 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 this, like, tough, strong woman who's going to never back down to anyone. It wasn't that. It was just, you know, I was so, I wanted to write about a character that was inspired by the women I grew up with, the women that I, that I love. Um, and they, all of them, if they were in those situations, I have no doubt that's how they would have responded. And and so I just I, I didn't it wasn't a conscious thing it just was I was just writing from what I knew and uh, and then when we started reading the script people people thought it was you know that was funny or people thought it was like really you know, like, yeah yeah, like, yeah. Mm, cool like I, you know that's a great response um, but it, I wasn't going for any sort of like a I was just trying to make some grand statement. Hit them as hard as you can yeah, and that, tell them you know Taekwondo. That's verbatim, you know, <laughs> what my mom told me. Um, it's probably not the best advice to give a kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know, I, I think it was the, you know, my parents and, and others, you know, like my parents who were immigrants at that time. They did the best they could to, to give the best advice that they thought they could give to their kids, you know, in order for them to defend themselves and grow up. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> the layers of this film and just the beautiful journey from childhood into adolescence into, uh, you know, the connection of the, the son and mother being able to meet square eye to eye and, and really be real with each other finally um, came through so beautifully when he finally you know he puts on the coat mm -hmm. his dad's coat it did feel like it really sunk in in that minute um, and it fits like it just fits in perfectly because it's his dad's coat um, and uh, that was a really beautiful powerful moment did you, you know, oh yeah sorry you know that's, that's the improvisation yeah because who the scene on the tractor? Yeah. The, we 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 done just one shot. Okay. Because the sun goes down. Yeah. So we didn't have time to do it again, and we, we didn't have time to get some uh, instruction from director. We, just, we were just like right. I mean, we shot all that crazy stuff. It was shot in four days. Wow. So we had to move so fast, like no time to waste, and that was a tough day. We were just running out of time. We, you know, we had to wrap people out. And so we all just kind of like rushed over to this other area of the town. And it was like, you know, it's maybe like eight of us total, including the actors, and just like, okay, go, just just start, just start shooting, and then we just kind of like whispered a couple of things. It was just like, yeah, make sure you get to this point, get to that point, and we just shot, and they just kind of, the two of them just did all of that stuff, and all happened so organically. Um, they didn't know what was in the bag either. Oh wow. Uh, and it's, it's so crazy. I mean, there were so many just like magical little things that happened in the film making of this film. That jacket was originally in the script. It's supposed to be a school uniform. Oh. We couldn't find one that was period appropriate. So then 
We said, you know what, let's swap it up. Let's switch it to a, a military uniform. Okay. We couldn't find one that was authentic. All right. But the house we were shooting in, the the owner of the of that house, he was a career um, uh, uh, paratrooper. Well. He was he served his entire <laughs> life in the military, and we just randomly found in his closet this jacket. Huh. And we're like, what the hell is this? Why is it here? Like, we've been searching everywhere for this. And it was just right there in that house. Um, that was the parents' house. And, wow, wow, wow. and so I called mom and I said, like, what is this jacket? Who does it belong to? And can we sh use it in the movie? And it was like, yeah, go ahead. Just don't put my name on it, but go ahead. Ethan tried on and it just fit. It just yeah. fit. By the time I went to Korea, really, like, her and Ethan, mm -hmm. They just, they were the characters. They, they, there was no actor in character. They just had become one person by that point. And it was such a such an incredible thing to watch. And, you know, because I just, I just st stepped back and I went, they got this, just let them go and make sure we film it right. Make sure the mic is good, make, you know. But that's why she was saying I didn't give any instructions or direction. You let her need to. It's like, this is the setting. This is the prop. We're going from point A to point B. Whatever you do, it just works. Because they, they were so, the relationship too, were just so tight, it was so real and authentic. It was, you know, there was, everything just happened so organically. And, and we were just at the mercy of the movie guys and, and just had to get out of the way. Because yeah. a lot of it was, we only had time to do like one day. That never happens on an indie shoot. Yeah. <laughs> But we, you know, I was like, you know what, let's embrace it. Yeah. You know, that la the final day, you know, the final scenes we shot the final day. Mm. And we actually did kind of map up the day so that we would be climbing up that mountain and we would shoot, 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 and get to the final spot and then wrap out. We, we you know, we mapped it out. We planned the day out to this, you know, the time of the sunset. And, um, we, you know, and then we basically just let the actors have that experience. It was never a situation where we went and cut and it's like, I don't think this is working. I think you should try more this or that. It was just, it was good. It is what it is. Like, it's not even, it wasn't even like what I'm hoping to get out of the scene. It's just whatever was happening is what I took because it just was perfect. It's so evident as an auteur that you are drastically here to serve the story forward within the container of your vision but that you really and just from hearing how you've described your process and even um, growing up and uh, that you were just really here to serve it forward and to trust the folks are doing the job that they know how to do their job and that you can let it be and become and Christopher Liu. Now that I'm hearing it was just a few day shoot and these time constraints you were under, that's nothing new for film, but the, the majesty of what he captured, the fields, the intimacy of the conversations, the silence, and the simplicity of, of the scenes. It's not very busy, and yet the pacing is just somehow perfect. Um, a lot of that looks like it was, it's obviously attributed to your direction, but his, his use of cinematography keeps it active, keeps it interesting. I mean, Chris is the, the other piece of this dynamic that makes it all work. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, you have, you have to approach this as though you are, the, you are another character in the scene. So you have to understand where you sit in this moment emotionally. You have to know how, you know, you physically and emotionally are responding to what's happening in front of you. Um, and, you know, and he took it on and, and he was just incredible. And even he never made a sound, like noise, any noise. So he, he was like ghost. Like, so for, for the actors, like, he never interfere or make any, like, noise to distract us. It's awe striking the degree to which he will show up and the top of the stairs when she's talking down about illness and then it moves and looks down. I mean, there it's just an intrinsic ability to be in the moment and 
serve it for None of it happened by accident. Let's, let's just be clear about that. It was. Oh yeah. I mean, we shot really quick. Like we had very little days and time, you know, hours to shoot everything. But we made sure that we balanced it out by having given ourselves a lot of time to prep. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, if I learned anything about filmmaking with this, it's prepare. It's that that preparation. I think we had, you know, that we had with the actors with Chris their art team that's what you know it's like by that by the time we got to actually rolling and making the film I really didn't have to like, give much direction or there was no there was no disagreement just we all knew why we were here and and it was you know it just felt like it's my job to just get out of the way and just yeah. let everyone do their jobs and and make sure they don't you know get lost or wander or you know the intentionality comes through just just in every single moment. Every actor, whether they're in there for just a minute or these longer, that really poignant scene with uh, John Cassini as the doctor, it's just so clear that every person who shows up in the film had that same level of preparation and just really fit into the world that you built um, and left for you to carry so beautifully. In no way does it come across as accidental. It comes across as, in fact, one of the most precise, intentional films I've ever seen. Um, but just hearing your relationship to filmmaking and letting things go uh, when needed um, is it just really exemplifies masterful filmmaking. I mean, you now, having received the Platform Award at TIFF, this is no small award. This is huge. This is something that's not reserved for only emerging filmmakers or veteran filmmakers or celebrated world stage. This is like a, a pretty massive thing. Um, and making that leap from daughter, which is beautiful and powerful, now into this, to this sudden catapult. What, what does this mean for you and your filmmaking journey? It's funny because in one, you know, in one way, so much has changed and I feel like there there's doors opening for me that weren't available before and in certain ways I feel like getting another film made is a little bit easier mm -hmm. but at the end of the day the process of making a film doesn't change I yeah. still have to get up early in the morning and sit in front of that computer and, and, and you know argue with myself and you know type 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 delete 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 like you know hours of self-doubt and misery trying to write something that I think is worth watching. That process is, is nothing's changed. Like, it's still daunting as ever, um, but it's, it's incredible what's happened. Um, because I've been in this industry for a long time. I've been, I've been, I started as an actor 20 years ago, and I've, I've had more rejection and failures I think the average person ought to happen in their life, but you know, I, I kind of persevered because I, I really, really genuinely love telling stories and, and this craft. Like, I, do, I don't do this to try and win awards. Like, that's never like a goal of mine whenever I start to do something. But any, you know, any, all of this, like even this interview, the fact that somebody cares enough to sp talk to us about this thing we made is is so overwhelming and such an honor. The honors, the audiences, this film is a gift. It's a gift. When something catches fire, it's because it's ready. It's because all the elements are there to allow that to. And for an audience to be ready to be carried with it. Obviously that will be a really powerful story for Koreans, for immigrants, for anyone who's experienced um, edge walking between two worlds and also it really it, it, it really lands in a broader perspective now and what does that say to you maybe in confidence of being able to tell stories that you didn't tell before is there more now that you feel perhaps you might be you know playing tug of war with your writer's instincts but is there something where you go okay now I'm ready to dip in a little deeper let's why don't we tackle this subject matter 
I'm really trying not to like try and recreate any of what's been successful about this film. Oh. I'm, I'm just I'm trying to just forget it and just go, you know, just write from the heart and just write what feels honest. And, um, I, I definitely want to, whatever is next, I would like it to be something where people watch and they don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's my goal. I, I, um, I don't, you know, there's some ideas percolating, and, but that's just that's the one thing I want. And I don't want people crying in this next one. <laughs> for, for dark, dark, dark comedy. Maybe, maybe. People, I don't, know, I don't want to be known as like the person who's like trying to make people cry <laughs> watching my movies. <laughs> There's something about truth and beauty that brings tears, and sometimes they're joyful. Sometimes it's just a recognition of something that you know we haven't been able to see made tangible. Because this film is a masterclass in in precision and allowing. Um, do you have things lined up now? Has your agent been getting all the phone calls? Are you? Yeah, I have several meetings coming up, but yeah. I'm good. We yeah. can't wait to see what's next. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I can wait. <laughs> so um, just a joy. A joy speaking with you both. An absolute honor and privilege. And Rice Boy Sleeps. Um, make sure make sure to see it. At least thrice. <laughs> see it on the big screen. Yeah. Yeah, it must be seen on the big screen. Thank you, Anthony and Yoon. Thank you.